Good morning, everybody. Everybody have a good good night's sleep last night? Awesome. I'm Solomon Parker up here again. No introductions this time. You heard about me last night. Uh, let me introduce one thing, though. If you, if you read the back of the program and you see Professor, Professor Department of Etymology at University of Nebraska, it's also exactly identical to uh, Dr. Ellis's. I don't know if you noticed that. I uh, actually went to school at the University of Arkansas in civil engineering. So a little typo on that. If you're expecting a professor, professor of entomology, sorry, you're not getting that today. You have to, I, won't, I won't hold it against you if you just sneak back out. So today what I'm talking about is how to start beekeeping treatment free. Um, I could explain to you the reasons, but we kind of had last night, we talked about the reasons for being treatment free. Um, Neil put me in this slot in this room as an advanced topic. I personally don't believe that treatment free beekeeping is an advanced topic. Um, for the most basic reason is that people have been keeping bees treatment free for thousands of years since the beginning of beekeeping. It's only within the last 50 years or so that we really started doing treatments. So, and the other thing is I don't really feel like treatment free beekeeping is all that different from regular beekeeping. I'm, I'm working on writing a book right now about starting bees, starting keeping bees treatment free and it's, it's kind of a little frustrating because I'm, I'm treatment free beekeeping is beekeeping and so I have to go back and explain all of the basic stuff that you, you might have heard in the other room last night and fill in, fill in all these gaps about you know what a queen is and what a frame is and what a box is and all that stuff and then beekeeping, treatment free beekeeping is beekeeping it's just without the treatment and some slight different emphasis so instead of learning how to apply treatments properly we focus on, on learning methods of expansion and splitting and catching swarms and things. Um, we also don't have to worry about uh, personal protective equipment. We don't have to worry about accidentally poisoning the dog or the children with treatments that have been left around or accidentally poisoning the bees. That can happen too. Um, we kind of avoid uh, systemic feeding or arbitrary feeding or stimulative feeding. The best stimulated, stimulated bees in the spring are bees that are properly adapted to your area so that they build up at the right time to catch the nectar flow. So you don't have to worry about trying to, to, to feed them to build them up and worry about all the, the issues that feeding introduces like um, robbing and uh, backfilling the brood nest and causing swarming. Um, and one of the, I'll get to that in a minute. So my first piece of advice, if you want to start beekeeping, beekeeping or beekeeping treatment free, is wait till next year. Now, if you're not ready next year, then wait till the year after that. The point I'm trying to make is don't get in it too fast. Don't buy into it until you are bought into it in a knowledge sense, right? Until you've, until you've researched what you want to do and how you want to do it, and then you can decide how you want to get into it. And it doesn't necessarily require buying anything. I'll talk a little bit later on choosing your hive, and if you have a little bit of woodworking skill, you can build your own hive of various different types, and you don't have to worry about buying anything. You can, you can use scrap wood. Can be done, don't have to pay anything. Don't have to buy bees. You can start with swarms. Um, one of the difficulties we have with new beekeepers especially is that in our lives here in the technologically advanced first world, we choose everything cafeteria style, right? We go through life and we pick the things we like, the things that have worked for us in the past and we stick with those things. And over time we develop this catalog of, of the way we like things 
And like if you're buying a car, for instance, you know what you like in a car. Most people like four wheels and an engine. Uh, some, some of you might like electric motors instead of engines. That's, that's me personally. Um, you might like a combination of the two if you want a hybrid car. But when it comes to beekeeping, new beekeepers especially, they don't have a framework from which to decide what to buy or what to do, what to get into, how to start. And so they might choose things that aren't necessarily compatible. Right? This, this method might not work with this hive. This hive might not work in this environment. Um, maybe uh, screen bottom boards provide too much ventilation and the bees don't like it in certain climates. Here, where it's fairly humid, screen bottom boards can be useful for ventilation, but in a place further north where it's, or high desert where it's dry and cold, bees don't like them so much. So in, in that case, my advice is to pick a mentor. Find somebody, and it doesn't have to be somebody you know. Optimally, it will be somebody you know that keeps bees the way you want to. And you can have personal access to them and learn from them. Um, surely you, you all know, if you're in this club, you know people around you that have bees already. Maybe if you're treatment free, you have a little bit less of, a, of a, an option on, on someone to follow like that. So you can follow somebody online. So for instance, for me, I started with Dee Lesby. Dee Lesby is kind of the grandmother of treatment free beekeeping. She, um, she developed the small cell theory back in the late 80s. Um, and she was like the first and only commercial treatment-free beekeeper for a long time. What she did agreed with the things that I had, had already decided were true. I had done my research and decided that larger hives were more normal and more useful. So I had already decided to keep hives at least three deeps, whereas normal is kind of two deeps, right? Um, she was available. She was on B-Source on the forum at the time, and you could talk to her and, and get information for, from her. And she had some published work so that I could go read her, read her work and, and figure out how she did things. So I had a good example that I could follow. Later on, a few years later, as I developed my own methods and figured out what I was doing and what worked in my climate and my area, I started to get away from the way she did things. And so now, you still see some aspects of what I do that are similar to hers, but I've developed my own method. And if you, follow, if you decide you want to follow me, you can do what I do. Some other options for online people, especially in the treatment-free genre, is like Michael Bush. Uh, things he does, he uses eight-frame mediums for weight. It also makes splitting simpler. You can take individual boxes and just kind of take a, take a hive that's maybe got six or seven boxes, take one box and deal them out to two different hives. You're virtually guaranteed to have a successful walkaway split from that without ever having to look in the hive at all. Um, he uses plastic frames, which are economical, easy to use, relatively cheap, last a long time, easy to work with. He uses simple homemade tops and bottoms usually. If you decide you don't want to build your own equipment, one of the things that easy is easy to build, doesn't require any complicated cutting or anything, is tops and bottoms. You can save yourself $30 a hive just by cutting out a piece of plywood and making tops and bottoms out of them. Or having a friend do it, or doing it with a friend. Somebody you know that has a table saw. He does limited intervention, and he also does small cell. And, most importantly, you can find him just about anywhere in the beekeeping world on the internet. He's on all the forums. Uh, he's not on Facebook, so there's that. And he does answer emails. Uh, if you're looking for something a little more off the beaten path, say you decide you're interested in top bar hives, you might check out somebody like Sam Comfort, who does top bar hives. Uh, used to be in New York, but he's got hives all over the place. He's kind of an itinerant beekeeper sometimes. He was actually here at the Big Bee Buzz four or five years ago. He's, um, he was uh, pretty fun to hang out with. Uh, he plays ukulele. You know, if, you've, if, if you were there for that, I mean, 
you got to hear some of his songs. They're pretty good. Um, top bar hives can be made out of scrap wood or at low cost, at least. You don't have to worry about special cuts. The most complicated thing you'll have to do is cut a board at an angle on the end, right? Um, and again, with him is a more limited intervention type method. Uh, another good one is, he's not really available. It's hard to get a hold of him though, so there's that fact. Uh, another one is Kirk Webster. If you're, if you, this is probably not an issue here because most of you are from not too far away and you have warmer climate, but Kirk Webster is from Vermont, so he's more of a cold climate beekeeper. He's got a lot of really good information on um, nucleus hives and how to make those and build those and, and include those in your, in, in your, in your inventory overwintering nucleus hives so that you can have fresh new hives every spring. Um, he's got a lot of really high quality articles that he has published in various places and they've been collected online. He has zero online presence personally. He doesn't answer, he doesn't have an email address I don't think. He doesn't do any forums or Facebook or anything. He has a phone number which you can call if you want to get a hold of him, but he's got to be in the office to answer the phone and probably has other things to do, so he's n probably not gonna wanna sit and talk to you for a couple hours. Uh, there's also some other options. Les Crowder was here four or five years ago. If you remember him, he's a top bar beekeeper in New Mexico. He's got a really good book. He's also got an online presence, so you can get information from him. Um, and then there's, if you're looking for more of a hands-off more of a spiritual beekeeping experience, you can look at somebody like Jacqueline Freeman out north of Portland. Um, and she has a book called Spirit Bee, if you're interested in that sort of uh, genre of beekeeping. So the next thing I want to talk about is where to get your bees when you're first starting out. Number one thing I tell people is stay away from packages. I'll give you a couple reasons for that. As best as I can tell, the information that I can put together from the Bee Informed National Survey that's done every year. By the way, if you've done the survey before, you should have the survey link for this year's survey in your email inbox. And if you haven't, get that from somebody. If you keep bees already, take the survey. It gives all of us a lot of really good information about what sort of methods and treatments, if you're interested in that sort of thing, work and don't work. Yes. Awesome, it's in the newsletter this month, great. Yes, it's a very important resource for all beekeepers. So if you have kept bees over the last year, even if they died, take the survey, give the information so that your information can be um, collected and we can get some, um, some good stuff out of it. But from that, I have, as, as best as I can tell, when people start from zero with packages, packages fail at a rate of somewhere around 45%. If you, would you buy a car in March if it had a 45% chance of blowing up in October? I wouldn't. I mean, unless I was desperate. But I'm not desperate, and especially with bees. You know, I need a car to get to work. I don't need bees to get to work. Um, Nukes, I've also heard nukes in this area have become a pretty poor choice. And it's for the same reason that packaged bees are. A lot of these bees come from, uh, they get made into packages or nukes after they get back from pollination in California, uh, where they've been sprayed with fungicides and trucked across the country and are not really in a good state of health. So I want to, we have this model in beekeeping today where we tell new beekeepers that they need to buy their starter kit, you know, a smoker and suit and a hive, and then buy a package. And we're setting them up for failure half the time. That's, that's just an unsustainable way of doing things. And I, and I, cannot, I cannot express this enough. When you buy bees like that, especially with the chance of them failing, um, you get bought in, you get invested into it, right? You spent money and you don't want to see your money lost. So that puts you in a state of fear. 
And fear leads to anger, and we all know anger, anger leads to the dark side, which is treating in this case. <laughs> But I'm, 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 I'm really serious. Like it, it leads you into this mindset where you're afraid that things are going to die. And when you switch to a model where you're catching swarms instead and then splitting your own bees that survive, if you catch a swarm and it dies, it's like, well, it's sad, but oh well. When you buy bees and they die, you're not only sad, but you've also lost $125 or whatever it is. And that makes you more sad. And so I want to keep bees in an optimistic way. I want, to, I want to be happy when they survive. I want to be optimistic that they're going to survive and not worried that they might die. See what I'm saying? So that's why I talk about swarms because number one, they're free. They're replenishable. If you lose your hive in the fall, you know how to catch swarms. You just catch some more next year. Not only that, but that hive you've lost in the fall has now left you with some really sweet used boxes with brood comb, which becomes a perfect swarm trap. You put that up in a tree or set it on a roof or even just on the hive stand where it's already at, and you have a really good chance of catching a swarm. You do a couple more things to it, like add some pheromone lure, like lemongrass oil or swarm commander or something like that, and now your chances of swarm goes up another 40%. Free bees. Two hives worth of equipment can make five or more swarm traps. So when you lose, and, and when you get into catching swarms, like it's like fishing. It's like catching bass, a nice strong fighting bass. It's fun. When you go out and check your swarm trap and there's bees in it, yes! You know, I got free bees. And even if they are some nasty commercial bees from somewhere, they're free. But chances are you're going to pick up some feral bees from somewhere that have been surviving on their own and they're healthy and they've swarmed out and now they're in your box. They've come from a tree or somebody's house that they didn't know that they had bees in there or some hole in the ground or a meter box or whatever. And now they're yours and you get to keep them and they're free and they're good. Um, another thing that, that I think is important is to, tr like I said last night, try and focus on having more than one hive. Every hive that you get is a chance to roll the dice to find the correct number or the, a beneficial number of traits in beneficial levels to, to be treatment free and to stay treatment free sustainably. And when those bees survive and do well, you split them and make more. If you can't do that on your own property, some, I don't, does anybody know the, the laws for Tulsa and how many hives, four hives in Tulsa? That's a good start. Go for four. Go for a couple more and just don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than it is permission and uh, most beekeeping laws I've found have zero enforcement. So you have to make a moral choice yourself on that one. I told you last night um, about the, the woman who called me up, my, my, a good friend of mine, you know, like the sort of person you go over to their house and eat their food, like a good friend, called me up and told me that she had gotten bees and needed me to help install them a couple days later. And this is the first I'd heard about it. Don't do that. Do your research ahead of time. Don't start beekeeping until next year. Find people first to talk to and ask them. I know I'm, I'm telling a, a, a bee club here. You all probably, this is, you don't need this information. But you can be proactive, those of you that are experienced beekeepers, in mentoring those people and helping them along. I mean, I've, I see a number of faces in here that I've seen when I was here five years ago. There's a, there's a good number of experienced beekeepers in here. And you can do your part to keep people from failing in the future. Be, you can be proactive in that way. If you're new to treatment-free beekeeping, one of the most important things that I tell people, especially online, because I do a lot of my work online, is don't act like an expert. Until you've got a few years under your belt, 
when you try and tell someone how to do something that you've never done, you look like a fool. And that's not helpful for teaching other people how to keep bees treatment free. If you're just parroting information, you don't really know what's backing that information up. One of the things that I've done personally over the years is I've made it a point not to talk about things that I haven't done. And if I do talk about things that I haven't done, like this afternoon when I'll be talking about different hive types, I'll tell you, I have not kept a war a hive. I have no intention of keeping a war a hive. But I'll tell you that ahead of time so that you can make the decision, you know, I'm going to tell you what is known about war a hives and the reason why I don't use them and reasons why I might use them. But I personally don't have that experience. And to get a better grasp on the information, you should find somebody who does and who has and get the information directly from them. Um, and the other thing, again, I talked about this last night is just don't buy bees and stop treating. You're setting yourself up for failure. Um, and especially if you're not buying bees that are already known to be treatment free and or mite resistant. If you don't have a trusted source to get bees from. Because like I said, the bees that you're buying are, they're not meant to survive in this climate. You know, it, it can get pretty cold here in the winter time when you get a, a blast of cold air down from, from Canada. Most of these bees were raised in South Texas or Florida or Alabama somewhere where they don't get quite the same thing. Or California where they don't get it at all. So you need bees from here or north of here. Bees that are better adapted for your area. Because they don't have, if you're treatment free, they don't have those treatments to fall back on when they can't do the job themselves. So, wow, I've gone through this quickly. More time for Q&A at the end. I love Q&A. Um, so the starter kit is one of the things that I tell people not to buy. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. A lot of times they're going to give you stuff you don't need or things that you might not like. Most of the time in a starter kit, you'll get like a hat like this some uh, a suit that's not connected or I've I don't think I've ever seen a starter kit that has a ventilated bee suit your summers get real good and hot and humid here you're gonna be sweating if you're naked much less wearing a full <laughs> suit on yourself so a good idea from the very beginning would be to go with a ventilated bee suit which you're not gonna get in a, in a starter kit other piece of advice smokers go with the big commercial smoker the bigger the smoker, the easier it is to light it and keep it lit. And the more options you'll have for fuel uh, and hopefully not have to pay for fuel. I personally use just little chunks of wood that I've sawed up, you know, like little inch or less chunks of wood. And what happens is it just smolders in the bottom of there. And then I've got this huge pile of wood on top of it so it cools the smoke. And then as it cycles down, I can just put some more wood on top. If you're, if you're using burlap, it's not so much of a big deal because it kind of smolders on its own and generally stays going. I always had problems with it trying to get it to stay going. But you wouldn't be able to use straight wood in a small smoker because it's going to get really hot in there and burn up the whole thing and you're going to be pumping the bellows and fire is going to be shooting out. I've done that, yeah. Yeah. Wood chips. Uh, somebody saying no. Wood pellets. You can use those too. The, the yeah, that's the important thing you need to worry about is burning too hot, and that's why I use the bigger smoker because even if I have a good hot fire down in the bottom, it's cooled by the fuel that's above it. And in a smaller smoker, that's going to burn up real quickly and shoot flames out. So whatever you find to burn in your smoker that works and produces a nice, cool smoke, use that. Pine needles. Pine needles work great. Yeah, 
free, free stuff. That's always important. Free stuff. That's why I use the wood chunks. Cow patties. Cow patties. To each his own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it works fine. <laughs> Whatever's free. <laughs> Just not, fresh. not fresh ones, good point. <laughs> um, no starter kit that I've ever seen comes with a treatment-free beekeeping book, because there aren't that many. One good example is um, of a treatment-free beekeeping book is Complete Idiot's Guide to Beekeeping by Dean Stiglitz and Lori Herboldsheimer. It's a very beginning book. It's not going to give you more advanced topics, but it's a beginning book, and you're not going to find that book provided with a, with a starter kit. You know, you're not going to find Michael, B Michael Bush's book provided with a starter kit. Better yet, Michael Bush's book costs 50 bucks. So just go read his website, because it's exactly the same. And he'll tell you that. I'm not like revealing any secrets either. He, he published a book because people wanted a book. But it's just his website on pages. So if you want to save that 50 bucks, go read that. I actually had, uh, I just got a message this morning that um, one, of my, one of my members of my Facebook group uh, Treatment Free Beekeepers on Facebook, if you want to check that out. We've got nearly 16,000 people now. I, I, when I started it back in 2013, I expected maybe we'd get a couple hundred people and we'd have some good conversations, but we get a couple hundred new people a week. I've been so incredibly surprised on how well it's done. Anyway, somebody at a, at a bee club meeting told this person to burn her Michael Bush book um, at least sell it. I mean, come on. It's 50 bucks. You yeah, get part of your money back. You sell it used or something. Anyway, yeah. Or donate it. Who knows? Um, another one is gloves. You're going to get uh, beekeeping gloves in, in a starter kit. I never used gloves from the very beginning. From, from 2003. If a hive was too mean to work with glo without gloves and a reasonable amount of smoke, I killed the queen. Like, it's not worth it to me to have, first of all, the, the pain, the fear. I don't want to be afraid to go in a hive. And secondly, it's a liability. I don't want somebody's dog or kid to get stung from, from wandering around my neighborhood. So, and also I don't like to squish bees and stuff. But the, high, the, the gloves you're going to get in, in a starter kit are the cheaper, stiffer gloves. If you're going to buy gloves, go straight to the commercial ones. There's a reason why people who wear them all day long wear different style gloves, because they're better. They cost a little bit more, but if you're going to buy stuff, buy the right stuff. If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. And you're probably going to get a queen excluder in these kits as well. I've never used queen excluders. I don't think they're necessary. I, when, I, when I began, I subscribed to the idea of having really big hives, five deeps. You let the queen and the brood nest range up and down wherever they want. Plenty of space to lay eggs. Plenty of space to rear brood. They're going to move up in the wintertime. Right? They're going to they're gonna eat that honey and move up in the hive. And then when they start laying up again in the spring, it's going to push the queen back down as, the, as the, the top of the hive is, starts to become filled with honey. When you start with a small hive and you have to worry about uh, backfilling the brood nest and swarming, that then presents a bunch of more work for you to get out there and get things fixed and try and prevent the swarming, etc. And it introduces fear again. And we don't want to be afraid of our bees. We don't want to be weighed down by the possibilities and the things we have to do. We want to enjoy it. We're all, most of us in here are doing it for the joy of it and not for the money. That's my audience. If, you, if you're doing it for the money and you just want to learn some extra information, great. But I'm speaking to the people who are relatively fresh beekeepers or at least fresh and treatment free. Yes? Uh, back up a little bit. Uh, when you're keeping that many uh, deeps, do you uh, do any kind of reversing? I don't generally do any reversing when I, I keep my, my boxes on my hive year round 
and that's something I got from Dee Lesby. Uh, I have, I do some frame rearrangement. Like I said last night, I like to put in fresh frames of foundation in the middle of the brood nest. And so that's naturally going to move things around a little bit because I got to move frames up and, and cycle some of them out and stuff. We do have beetles in my area, and I had more beetles when I was in Arkansas, but I've never had um, a slime out problem where the beetles get out of control and destroy the hive. Well, you got to help the hive beetle take care of the beetles. Yeah, and I find that to be true with a lot of treatment-free beekeepers. Um, for whatever reason that the bees have developed the traits to be able to handle mites and other things. They also handle wax moths well and they handle beetle larvae well. And so even if a beetle gets in there and lays eggs, a lot of times the bees will find the eggs and get rid of the eggs. If bees don't have those heightened senses of smell or whatever they use to detect those things, they're going to miss the eggs and they're going to hatch and you'll have problems. How do you feel about natural oil treatments? I don't do any treatments whatsoever. Um, oils are going to be better than more, more, like pesticide. Pe yeah, pesticide options, but ultimately I'm looking for bees that survive on their own, totally on their own. And the last thing I have on the, on the hive kit is a lot of times they come pre-assembled. So you've now paid somebody money to assemble your hive for you. And it's really not that difficult to assemble a hive. You can do it with a hammer, an attack hammer. Uh, or if you, you want to do other options, you can build your own. If you have some wood, woodworking skills or somebody you know has woodworking skills. Yeah. I used solemn I used sol solid bottom boards. I, when I first started beekeeping, uh, there was a big thing going around about use. That's kind of when screen bottom boards came into being. And the idea was that mites would fall through the screen and um, they'd be out of the hive, so they would help. I discovered pretty quickly that in my dry summer, the bees pretty much vacated the bottom box because there's too much ventilation down there. Don't quite have the same problem here because of the humidity and um, screen bottom boards can be, be beneficial. Uh, as far as Varroa goes though, the Bee Informed National Survey, if you look at their numbers, you, the use of screen bottom boards does not decrease mortality of hives. So as far as we can tell, using screen bottom boards doesn't help the hive with Varroa, or at least doesn't help the, the hive live for whatever reason that is. The other thing that I realized a couple years into it when I started beekeeping was that if the screen bottom board does help, then it's something that I don't want because I don't want my intervention to be what allows the bees to survive. I want them to do that on their own. So that's why I switched to solid bottom boards, plus they're easier to make, because you can make them out of a piece of plywood. And then when I lived in Arkansas and needed more ventilation, I had a nice big bottom entrance and a nice big top entrance, and that gave me plenty of ventilation. Yeah. I have done, usually the only time now that I reduce the entrance is when I'm creating a new hive or a nuke or a split or something. And when I go from like four or five deeps with a big three quarter inch full width entrance and then I make a split, I'm now dealing with a single deep hive that's got that same three quarter inch there's not going to be as, much, as many bees to be able to guard that, so I like to, to bring that down. As far as um, for winter time, for ventilation, uh, I have in the past reduced the entrance, but I've also not done it and haven't seen a huge difference. Maybe the bees will use a little bit more honey, um, but maybe the ventilation is better. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a cost-benefit with using more honey and having better ventilation so you have less problems with moisture. That's something that is going to be completely different in different climates. You know, he, where I am in Oregon is a, all winter is a nasty, wet, not particularly cold, but just wet and drab and overcast all winter long. Here you guys get more 
nice flying days earlier in the year. And so that may not be quite the same issue. May not, yeah, up and down temperatures. And you also don't get quite as much rain in the winter. Yes? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that kind of contradict your statement of living by the other? Because if you're killing that queen of a hive that defends itself and replaces it with a hive that's more docile, aren't you encouraging basically a hive to not defend itself? In a sense, yes. But that is beekeeping. You know, in, in the same way that um, pit bulls were raised for years and years to be fighting dogs. But any time a pit bull would bite a human, it would be put down. Well, see, the reason I ask that is because I've got lives that are in locations where there are people are not around. Mm -hmm. So if a person has lives that are like that, and they are replacing the queen more docile, friendly, what happens then if a skunk invades that body and the hive doesn't have that tenacity to defend itself? You're actually in a sense, but again, it depends on it depends on how they're reacting. Um, as far as a skunk, I haven't really seen any hive that could really defend itself against a skunk. Skunks are pretty smart, and the way they deal with the bees, you know, they attack at night, and they basically de-sting the bees before they even eat them. So uh, there's that. In the case where I am, where there's bears sometimes, bears have been eating bees for hundreds of years. So um, what I'm really focusing on is the ability to, like I said, if it's a hive, I don't even particularly care about a defensive hive, as long as that's maintained within a certain envelope. I don't want to want somebody to be walking down the road. One of my yards is, uh, say, 30 or 40 feet from a road where there are regularly bicycle races, and I don't want. Yeah. Yeah, and if the other thing is if they don't respond to smoke, uh, there are certain types of bees, especially Africanized bees, that. You smoke them and they go crazy. It doesn't help. That's not useful. I want bees that are controllable, even if they aren't necessarily like stingless. Yeah. That's a good question. Right. That's a good question. And there, we are on, still today, and especially in this area, on the front of the expansion of the Africanized bee. If you go down to South America and look at the bees that have been um, developed over the, you know, the, the, most of you probably know the story, the, the African bees were accidentally released back in the 50s, and it's the hybrids between the African bees and the bees that are already here that are the nasty ones. Over time, in the past 60, 70, how many years it was since those bees were released, those bees down there have been bred back to more docile, more workable characteristics while retaining some of the good characteristics of high production and um, disease resistance. Because we're here on the front, uh, we're still dealing with the bees that are really mean. Over time, and this is, is seen even as far, far north as Texas, we're starting to see bees that have been over the years following 
that really mean, vicious streak bred back out of them while retaining some of the beneficial traits. Uh, B. Weaver is about the only um, real big commercial bee supplier has been treatment free for about 15 years now. They have tested their bees genetically and found a certain number of, of Africanized genes in their bees. And their bees are, can be a little bit mean, but generally not. And it's, it's, when we, mean bees are often found when we stop treating, when we stop breeding for, um, gentleness while we're trying to get to the treatment-free stage. So a lot of times we're left with that and then once we, once we achieve that level, then we go back to that secondary trait of gentleness. Because first of all, we want them to survive and that's the most important thing. But after that, we start to work on the other things. And that's just, that's agriculture, that's, that's husbandry, that's breeding, that's what we do as beekeepers. Yeah. She wants me to elaborate on my large hive concept. Like I said, I got that from Dee Lesby. She keeps her bees at five deeps year round. She's also in the desert, so it's a bit different. Very dry, not much um, uh, humidity issues. What I have found, this is my theory, is that at the end of the winter, the bees will sort of take stock of what's in their hive. And in a natural hive, in a tree somewhere, when they take stock of a hive, they've got a fixed volume, right? So they'll go and they'll, they'll sort of, and I, I, I say this in human terms, but they'll go and they'll look around and figure out how big the hive is and how much honey they have and what they have to fill. And if they have a smaller cavity, uh, they'll, they'll see this size and they'll go, oh, well, we can fill this up this year. We'll be fine for swarming and we'll swarm this season. Good to go. They maybe see a bigger cavity if they live in a bigger cavity and they say, well, this is big and empty. We'll probably try and fill this up this year, but we're probably not going to swarm. And then so they proceed to try and fill that hive up. Swarming season goes by and they don't swarm. In the kept hives, the, the typical way that it's taught on how to super hives, by the time we get around to supering hives, the bees have already decided that they're going to swarm. And it's too late to stop them, no matter what you do. Now, the, I'll talk about later about splitting, how you, can, how you can interrupt a swarm and get a bunch of splits out of it. But I feel that the model where you reduce your hive and store your supers over winter leads to the swarming problems that most people have. And I have found myself that keeping big hives year round, I have a very low swarming rate. Very rarely do, I, do my hives swarm when they're that big year round. Because we're not taking into account the fact that in nature, there's nobody to take the supers off. And so the bees, we think they work on a yearly cycle when actually maybe they work on a multi-year cycle. And they need to fill up that space with honey before they're going to decide to swarm. And that may take them several years. How that works out in my beekeeping practice is basically when I harvest the honey off the hive, I'll take, I'll usually leave the bottom three deeps alone completely, or five mediums if that's what we're doing. And then I'll take whatever's above that and harvest that. And then when I'm done, I'll just put those boxes back on. And the bees will fill back up some, and usually I won't harvest that because I want to leave that for them for winter. And they will also guard it, if it's a nice strong hive, they will guard it against wax moths for the rest of the year, even if it never gets filled up. And so I don't have to worry about moth crystals or wax moths. Time's up. I'll be around. I've got two more talks this afternoon if you want to come and see me then. And if you see me anywhere, feel free to stop me and ask me questions, anything. I'm, I'm here for the whole time. <laughs>